Okay. So again, we'll be recording this call. So I am, I'm Julie Robb, Community Relations uh, Representative here at Ida Culver House Broadview. We are here at Broadview. There's a lot of things happening. We've got, uh, we're now doing in-person activities. We've got our, our dining room back open, which has been really, really wonderful for our residents to be able to get back together, spend time with each other. Um, we have uh, our newest portion of our community, the terrace at Ida Culver House Broadview, which is our memory care uh, portion of our community is going to be opening this coming June. So uh, we will be having a fully remodeled first and second floor of the D building that will be able to um, offer to folks who need memory support. Uh, we'll have an additional, or I should say a new 44 apartments in the terrace. So that's something that's very, very exciting. And we've been waiting quite a while to have that project completed. So looking forward to that this summer. Um, yeah, so I would say that's about it. I think we'll turn it over to Tina. Uh, again, thank you all so much for joining and, and we'll turn it over to Tina Hall. Thanks, Julie. If you want to unshare your screen, I'll go ahead and pull up my presentation here. Give me just one moment. No Here problem. We there we go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And then we will get going from beginning. Let's see. Okay. There we go. Let me see if I can move this bar that might be in your way. All right, well, as, as Julie said, today we are going to go through some retirement living options and talk about some of the differences. And um, so for starters, what does your crystal ball show you, tell you about your future? Wouldn't it be nice if we could all tell what's coming in the future? And we all have this vision of how we want to age and where we want to age, but there are a lot of factors that may come into play that we haven't considered that can definitely impact um, our choices. For example, 70% of people over the age of 65 will at some point either have some level of cognitive impairment or need assistance with two or more activities of daily living in their lifetime. And that's things like dressing and grooming, shower assistance, and that sort of thing. The other thing to, consider, to, to take into consideration is that social isolation is a growing epidemic among our older population. And I don't think I really need to tell you all about how, how difficult social isolation can be because we've all just come through 2020 where we've experienced it. But there is a growing body of evidence that indicates that social isolation can have dire consequences on your physical, mental, and emotional health. So the point of this is that, you know, Again, none of us really has a crystal ball. We don't really know what to expect from the future. So our best option is to be prepared to make a plan and maybe make a backup plan so that we can make our own choices and get ahead, get ahead of any potential crisis. So today we're gonna go over several terms. As you can see, we're gonna go through age-restricted, independent living, assisted living, et cetera, et cetera. We're just gonna walk through one by one and hopefully answer the questions that you might have and explain the differences between each type and what type is appropriate for different people. Starting with an age-restricted community. And this really is just what it sounds like. This is a housing development or an apartment complex it can be gated or secured, and this is for individuals who are at least 55 years old or older. You can rent or you can buy, depending on the model of the age-restricted community. Um, usually, your community and yard maintenance are included, and your transportation services are typically included, and sometimes activities are included, and sometimes outings may be included. It really varies depending on the type of age-restricted community you're looking at. In all cases, you're not gonna find your meals or your housekeeping services are included and rarely are utilities included. Although occasionally, similar to an apartment complex that's not age restricted, you may find some that do include some of your utilities. Within an age restricted community, there are no personal health care services, no health management services. And 
it is not it is not a situation where it's going to be regulated by the Department of Social and Health Services. So there's no liability for any care issues that you may experience. And we come to independent living community. And an independent living community is a retirement residence that's really for active independent individuals who are 62 years old or older and really are just ready to turn over the cooking and the cleaning and that home and property maintenance to someone else so that they can just focus on enjoying life. An independent living community is gonna provide a variety of social activities, educational activities, different types of wellness programs and exercise programs, um, nutrition, a nice support network, not only of staff, but of other of the residents, um, and then often types of concierge services as well. Rather than providing care, the focus at an independent living community really is on helping you maintain your independence, your functionality, and your health and wellness for as long as possible while you're enjoying this active, engaged lifestyle. Within this community setting, your monthly rent is going to include the apartment itself, some of your meals, your utilities with the exception of your telephone, it's going to include we weekly housekeeping services, transportation services, all of that home and yard maintenance, as well as a variety of life enrichment activities and access to help. Now the type of life enrichment activities and the, the community setting itself can vary widely depending on the community that you select. Your rent and your service pay, your rent and service fees rather are going to be paid for privately through your own personal savings. Many independent living communities that you may look at also have assisted living services. In some models, accessing these services may require that you move to another wing in the building if the community does not offer flexible licensing. Flexible licensing applies the community, excuse me, flexible licensing allows the community to apply an assisted living license to the apartment you're already living in. And unless the community also does provide assisted living services, an independent living community will not offer personal care services or any type of health management services. And they're not gonna be regulated by DSHS, which means in a strictly independent living community, there's no oversight and the community is not liable for any care issues that you may, uh, you may have. Now, rolling right into an assisted living community, this is actually gonna be somewhat similar to that independent living community. This is also a retirement residence for individuals who are 62 years old or older. However, in this case, it also provides some level of assistance with your activities of daily living, such as medication management, shower assistance, dressing and grooming, and that sort of thing. Similar to that independent living community, an assisted living community is also gonna provide social and educational opportunities and wellness programs, nutrition, et cetera. And in an assisted living community, your monthly rent is going to include everything that that independent living community includes, plus it's going to include all of your meals rather than just some of your meals. However, your care plan within the assisted living community, which addresses your specific individual care needs is going to be a separate cost. And the cost of your care plan is really going to be determined by the complexity of your care needs. And your care plan is created through a nursing assessment, which is done before you move in. And once your nurse walks you through your nursing assessment, they will then design your care plan. And again, the more assistance you need, the higher that cost of your care plan is going to be. It's a separate cost. You've got your rent cost and your care plan cost in an assisted living community. Most assisted living communities fees must be paid for privately, similar to your independent living community. And several assisted living communities will also accept long-term care insurance as a form of payment if you happen to have a long-term care insurance policy. There are some assisted living communities that will also accept Medicaid as a form of payment. Although this is uncommon, particularly in urban locations, the further you get away from, from urban locations, the more likely you are to find those types of communities. Um, and even in those cases, it is highly likely you will need to pay for at least two to four years privately before you're allowed to convert to Medicaid. And then finally, assisted living communities must strictly adhere to laws that govern how they operate. They are going to be inspected every 12 to 18 months 
by a surveyor from the Department of Social and Health Services to ensure that they are in compliance with all of these, these rules. And you as a consumer can and should ask to see copies of a community's most recent DSHS survey so you can see how they're doing and how well they are complying with the rules that are in place to keep residents safe and to respect their dignity. Next type of community is a secured memory care community. And this, this is a retired, this is a retirement community or sometimes a dedicated area or neighborhood within an assisted living community that is specifically for individuals who have a high, well, mid to high stage level of cognitive decline or dementia. And therefore they must have some level of monitoring and or assistance really available at all times. A secured memory care community is gonna provide a wide variety of activities, special exercise and nutrition programs, and a higher caregiver to resident ratio than you would find in an assisted living community. You're also gonna have a higher level of monitoring and a higher level of caregiver interaction. And this will be provided in a secured environment that has coded exits so that residents, should they forget that they live there, are not likely to um, leave the building and potentially you know, cause self-harm. Your monthly rent within a secured, secured memory care community is going to include your apartment, all of your meals, utilities, housekeeping, et cetera, and activities that are appropriate for wherever the individual is within their cognitive and physical abilities. The care plan, like with an assisted living community is a separate cost. And typically you will find that your care plan cost is higher in a secured memory care community due to the higher caregiver ratios. And usually because you find that individuals who are living in secured memory care typically need more care services uh, than those who are living in assisted living, although that is not universally true. Care plan costs and services must be paid for privately in secured memory care as well, or by long-term care insurance. And unfortunately, very, very few memory care communities accept Medicaid, particularly, again, in urban locations. It is somewhat challenging to find. Sometimes you will find secured memory cares in assisted living communities. Like I said, they may be neighborhoods located within an assisted living community, or you might find standalone memory care communities. And like an assisted living community, a secured memory care community is going to be surveyed by the Department of Social and Health Services every year to 18 months to ensure that they are in compliance with all the various laws governing how they operate. I'm moving along quickly. It's a very odd format to be talking and not have any, any uh, feedback from people that I'm talking to. So if I get to going too fast, somebody let me know or if I'm too quiet, let me know. Okay, moving along, the next thing would be an adult family home. Now, an adult family home is different than the, than the types of communities we've just gone over. An adult family home is a much smaller environment because it is a residential home that DSHS has licensed to care for up to six individuals in that home. An adult family home is appropriate for someone who requires a very frequent level of monitoring or frequent level of, of assistance. So for example, if someone has an advanced level of dementia or if they are a fall risk or very frail or just need a lot of one-on-one -on -one interaction on a pretty regular basis, an adult family home may be a, a very appropriate setting for that person. A person who is relatively independent or just needs a light level of care probably would not want to consider an adult family home at all because it's not going to give them the kind of robust interaction you're gonna see in the previous types of care settings that I've gone over. They do provide a very high level of interaction, close monitoring, a very calm, quiet environment typically, and transportation to doctor's offices. But again, there's very, very little activity or stimulation within an adult family home environment. And unlike the independent living community, assisted living community, or memory care community, your costs at an adult family home are all wrapped into one cost. It's not separated into rent and then care fees. It is one cost and it is dependent on the complexity of your care needs and then other factors like the size of your room and whether the staff is awake at night and of course the location. 
Adult family homes are also paid for privately. And occasionally long-term care insurance policies will recognize adult family homes and pay out on those insurance policies. But it's something that you would definitely want to check because adult family homes often are denied by long-term care insurance companies. On the other hand, many adult family homes do accept Medicaid as a form of payment, though typically this is only going to be the case once the individual has been living there and has paid for care privately for some period of time. Adult family homes are regulated and inspected by DSHS, just like your assisted living communities and your memory care communities. And again, if you are touring an adult family home on behalf of a loved one family member, I do highly encourage you to read the most recent copy of that survey to find out how they're doing um, in terms of adhering to the regulations that apply to how they operate. There are literally thousands of adult family homes in Washington state. There are close to 2000 in King County alone. So it makes it very difficult to find an adult family home that is appropriate and the spectrum of quality can, can really, really vary. In fact, the spectrum of quality in adult family homes really varies more than even in an assisted living setting or an independent setting. So if you are considering an adult family home for a loved one, I strongly would advise you to engage the services of an elder care advisor. Okay, I know I'm going through a lot of things quickly and I promise you we'll have time for questions when we get through. Next, nursing home. Nursing homes, often referred to as skilled nursing communities, deliver care that cannot be delivered in any other setting per Washington state regulations. In a nursing home setting, you're going to have RNs or LPNs who are available 24 hours a day, and they will check in on patients regularly as needed. You're not really going to have a lot of privacy in a nursing home setting. Typically you share a room and your space is your bed and maybe a little wardrobe and your television and not much else. The good thing is most of us are not going to need to live in a nursing home. When you think about living long-term in a nursing home, only about 4% of the population of Washington state will at some point require long-term care in a nursing home. If you are living in a nursing home long-term, Medicare does not pay for your long-term care, and this does need to be paid for privately or with long-term care insurance. However, when you run out of money, if you're living in a long-term setting with skilled nursing, Medicaid does usually kick in. So that does cover that for the patient that is living in a nursing home long-term. Now, though I said only about 4% of the population in Washington state will live in a nursing home long-term, a lot of us are going to need a nursing home at some point for a short-term stay or a rehab stay or therapy after some kind of health issue. A lot of us might have, say, a, a hip fracture or a stroke or some sort of a severe illness and go to hospital for a few nights. And then instead of being discharged home immediately, you might go to a skilled nursing community for a number of days. About 80% of us are at some point in our lives going to need a skilled nursing stay. So they really do serve two purposes. If you are going to a nursing home for some rehabilitation after an illness, the good news is Medicare will pay for your rehab stay for a period of time up to 100 days. However, you do need to meet several conditions. The first of which is you do need to have three qualifying stay, excuse me, three qualifying nights at a hospital under admission status for Medicare to then pay for your rehab stay at a nursing home. And then the other thing is your Medicare A benefit will only pay for the first 20 days. After that time, your Medicare B benefit will kick in and you will have a significant copay for each additional day you're then in skilled nursing. And if you do go to skilled nursing, you must continue to show improvement on a daily basis in order to continue to have Medicare pay for that stay. If you stop making progress, you can either discharge to your previous setting, whether that was home or an assisted living community or an adult family home, or if you then convert to long-term, you may continue to stay there, but then you would have to pay privately. It can be a little confusing, I know. Then we come to life plan community. 
formerly called a continuing care retirement community. And these are the communities that people commonly refer to as buy-in communities or entrance fee communities. <coughs> excuse me. In order to move into an entrance, excuse me, in order to move into a life plan community, you must be independent to move in. If you already need assisted living services, generally you're not gonna be admitted to one of these types of communities, although some communities do make some exceptions, particularly if you're, you are well, um, you have a, a well spouse and a spouse that might need just a tiny bit of assistance, but generally you do need to be independent to move into this, uh, into this setting. These CCRCs typically are going to provide all levels of care on the same campus. So you'll have independent living, you'll have assisted living services available, memory care, and a skilled nursing community on the same campus. And oftentimes these are luxury models. And as your needs change, let's say you move in and you are independent, and then at some point you do need assisted living services. Typically, you're then going to have to move to another area of the building or to another building on the campus to then receive the next level of care because unfortunately, not a lot of CCRCs offer that flexible licensing. And if you'll recall, flexible licensing means that when you move into your independent living apartment, as you need to, to add services, assisted living services, the community simply applies an assisted living license to the apartment you're already living in rather than having you move to another segment of the building to have assisted living services. Uh, there are a lot of models of continuing care retirement communities and a lot of different forms of payment. In some cases, you're going to get part of your, your, your entrance fee back to your heirs or to you should you move out at, at some point. And in other models, you're not gonna receive any back. So it really, really depends on the life plan type of community you're looking at. If you're considering a CCRC as an option, you know, it's really a good idea to ask a lot of questions because if you are contemplating this, you're going to have a very significant upfront cost. And maybe it is, it is absolutely a wonderful thing for you, but it also may not be. So get a copy of the packet, take it to your financial advisor, particularly if it's a financial advisor that has some experience with CCRC so that they can review the paperwork and make sure that it really is a good fit for you. And one more note about CCRCs, sometimes you will, you will talk with a CCRC and they will tell you, you know, we have all levels of care, which they do, and that's true, and it's a good thing. But don't be fooled into thinking that you're going to absolutely need that skilled nursing. Sometimes people say when you need skilled nursing, as if you would need it long term. And the truth is, 4% of us will need that long term. So just remember to keep that in mind. Okay. Let's see, now that we've gone through the various types, I wanna shift gears a little bit and talk about, you know, how can you tell if a community is the right fit for you personally, okay? So there are a lot of questions you can ask yourself. Some of the most important things to think about is, uh, excuse me, one of the most important things to do is to really think about your own situation and have a realistic understanding of your situation both right now and what's likely to happen. We all like to see ourselves as younger than we are. We all like to think of ourselves as we are on our very best days. But when you're considering a move to a community, you really want to think about how do I do on my worst days? Because we want to plan for having that safety net on our worst days, not just our best days. You know, think about how your, how your situation is likely to change and develop over the next few years. Is the community that you're looking at going to be able to meet your changing needs or will you have to move again in a year? So really think about your specific situation and be realistic about it. When you're touring a community, you wanna look at more than just the age of the residents. Because again, we all see ourselves as we were 10 or 20 years ago. I know I do, I look in the mirror and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm in my thirties. I'm definitely not in my thirties. Um, so focus on that, that, that vibrancy and, and the cognition and, and, you know, really look, do people seem engaged? Do they seem happy? Are they enjoying themselves? What are their backgrounds? What are their interests? Will you have things in common with them? Will you enjoy um, socializing with, with the people there? Take a good look at their activities calendar and look at the kinds of things that they do. Are there a lot of things there that you really like to do? Are they readily available? Do they offer the various services and amenities that you personally want? 
whether that is um, a group of people that practice your faith, or um, maybe you, you wanna do water aerobics. Um, but you know, if they've got a bunch of services that don't really appeal to you because you're never gonna use, those are kind of irrelevant. So really think about what's important to you and do they provide that? If you have an opportunity, go to some of the events and the activities, have a meal, particularly share a meal with some of the residents so that you can ask them questions because they're gonna be very honest with you about what they like about the community. They're gonna tell you if they've had issues and more importantly, they're gonna tell you how that community resolved any issues that may have come up. So talk to the residents, they are the experts. When you're talking with the community relations folks, ask about care limitations. If you have an illness that is very likely going to need, excuse me, that is very likely going to lead to you needing a, a higher level of care, whether that's in the near future or down the road, you know, find out if they're gonna be able to meet your changing needs and find out if there are circumstances under which you would have to move out of that community. You know, at what point might they not be able to meet your care needs? Now that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to move to a community that can do every single thing because there's a lot of services that you may never need. So think about your specific situation. Again, have a realistic understanding of your situation, your diagnoses and where things are likely to develop as you're looking at communities. Then again, you know, if you find a community that you really, really like that fits your needs right now, and you're willing to consider a move later on down the line when you need it, you know, that's, that's not bad either. You really just have to think about what's important to you. Um, look at their most recent DSHS survey. I've said that a couple of times. I think this is so important because it tells you about their, their, their care services. You really want to know, how are they doing? Have they had a lot of violations on their survey? You know, if you go and look at the DSHS website, you will find that there are reports for nearly every single community, but they vary greatly in severity. If you've got a community that has a, a, a small violation on their survey that affects one person every you know, few years, that's a very different thing than if you are looking at a community that has enforcement letters as long as your arm. If you are looking at a community and you find that they have an ongoing series of enforcement letters or they have been in stop, in stop placement, that's a red flag because that really speaks to patient safety. Um, and that's, you know, if, if you are in a vulnerable position and you are putting yourself in someone's care, you want them to treat you with dignity and respect, but you also want to make sure that your, your care needs are going to be met and you're going to be safe. And then look at the financial model. What makes sense for you? Does a CCRC make sense for you? If, if you're planning on living there for a, a long, uh, uh, several years, it might be. If you've waited for quite a while, a CCRC probably isn't the best fit. Um, so just you know, look at the financial model, think about what you have in savings. If you have a long-term care policy, that's going to be very helpful. A lot of us don't, but you know, if you do, ask the community, if they've had success in helping people trigger their long-term care policy. So that's kind of some of the things you need to think about in choosing a community. But the other thing that I suggest you ask yourself is, how do you know when it's time for you to move to a community? This is a really tough question. You know, um, in fact, this is probably one of the, the hardest questions that people grapple with is when do I make the move to a community? So there are a lot of questions that you can ask yourself to help you get to a good timeline. The first one to start with is, how does my life compare now to how it was five years ago? You know, are you, are you starting to experience some functional decline or some cognitive decline? You know, are there, are there things that you're, you're, you're finding very difficult, whether that's the stairs on your front porch or vacuuming your living room? And, and what is that going to be like five years from now? How, how is it likely to develop? Are you thriving in your current environment or are you just sort of surviving in your current home? You know, do you just go from your bedroom to the bathroom, to the kitchen, to your bedroom, to the bathroom? You know, if, if, if you have a, this 4,000 square foot home, but you're really only living in two or three rooms, do you really need a home like that that you need to keep up and maintain? Maybe not. How often are you socializing? 
Do you see people every day? Do you see them once a month? How often do you want to see people? You know, if you've been a very, very social person all of your life and you're finding yourself more and more isolated, either because you've had people move away or pass away or stop driving, this can definitely impact your physical, emotional, and social health. So are you isolated? Are you still driving? If you're if you're not driving, can people get to you easily? Or are you in a location where if we have one of our fun freak snowstorms, people are not gonna be able to get to you to help you? How about food, nutrition? Are, are, you, are you cooking nutritious meals for yourself or is someone providing nutritious meals for yourself? Or are you living on processed foods and microwave meals? And would you benefit from having healthy meals? Are you a caregiver? This is oftentimes, um, a reason to think about moving to a community. If you're a caregiver and you've been providing care for your spouse for a long time, how are you feeling about that? Are you starting to feel burned out or exhausted? And would you benefit from having some support and some help? And how would that affect your life? You know, have you had a, have you had a fall or have you had a significant health scare in the last year? Sometimes people will have a significant health scare and then go home after they've had a lot of support and physical therapy and think that they're fine. But one of the reasons you end up feeling fine is because you have had that support and that physical therapy. And once that's removed, how long are you going to continue along before you have another health crisis? And then what might that look like? Have you been diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment or some form of dementia? And what is the likely progression of that going to look like? Even if you're not ready to move to a memory care community, if you, have a, a, if you have a diagnosis of say an Alzheimer's disease, it's a good idea to look now so that you know where you want to be when you need that care. Um, how would moving affect your relationship and your time with your family? If you've got a family member that, that really has, has become a primary caregiver and you no longer really have that strong familial relationship, it might be very positive to consider a move so that your daughter can be your daughter again rather than your caretaker. Because it, it can be awkward when you're having a family member who is providing care for you. So it's something to think about. And then I think for me, this is a big one. And I'm going through this actually with my mother right now is who do you wanna make that decision for you? Do you want to make that decision for yourself while you're fully in control or do you want your family to select it for you when you need it? And if so, will they select the place you want? Maybe they will. If you're having good conversations with your family about your future care needs and what you specifically want, maybe they will. But ask yourself, how much control do you want over what happens to you in your later years? This is important, I think, for all of us to think about. There may be some other really good questions, um, but these are the ones that I feel like you, you want to ask yourself. And then finally, I'm trying to pay attention to time. I, I know that oh, we're doing good. Great, we'll have lots of time for questions. Um, my last, I think this is my last slide. So thank you, Ida Culver House Broadview for allowing us to talk through these, these things. I just wanted to go over where Ida Culver, oh, Ida Culver House Broadview fits into this, this sort of continuum of care between independent, assisted, memory care, all of that. So Ida Culver is an independent senior living community. And they're in North Seattle and they've been family owned and operated for about 30 years. As an independent living community, they also do offer that assisted living piece with flexible licensing and secured memory care as well. This is a community that does have a very rich and diverse life enrichment program, very tasteful, elegant setting, um, gorgeous gardens. I don't know if any of you've seen them before, but they are, they're quite lovely, especially now in this time of social distancing when we can't really meet inside and some pretty amazing um, resident and family support services, which you can ask Julie about. I'm not gonna go into those today. Um, and then finally, the Idaho, Idaho Culver House community, in addition to all of the, the era living communities, really benefits from a long-term partnership that we've shared with the University of Washington. And that's with our schools of nursing, pharmacy, and social work. And again, that's something that you can talk more with the staff about rather than talking to me today. And that, kind of brings me to the end of the, the presentation piece. And at this point, I'd really like to open it to questions because I know I just went through a lot of information and I'd like to clarify any questions that anyone has for me today.
You know, we do have one question here. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about where Aljoya Thornton Place falls in uh, the categories of different types of communities? Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, Aljoya Thornton Place, which is a sister community to Ida Culver House Broadview, is an entrance fee community over uh, kind of near that, that Northgate area. They offer independent living and an individual must be independent to move into that community. And then when they do require assisted living services, just like with Ida Culver House Broadview, Aljoya has flexible licensing. And so the, we, we, they go ahead and apply an assisted living license to the apartment the individual is already living in. The Aljoya model is kind of a hybrid between uh, your typical CCRC and assisted living community. They do offer the highest level of care allowed under Washington state law for an assisted living community. So they are going to do things like two person transfer assistance, sliding scale insulin management, et cetera, et cetera. And then the other thing that they will allow for is if you do need skilled nursing services, particularly if you were needing to live in a skilled nursing, they would remove the assisted living license, partner with, uh, with an outside provider to bring in skilled nursing services to your apartment for you to be able to have skilled nursing services. The cost of that is similar to what you would experience living in a skilled nursing facility. So people are often surprised that it doesn't increase your costs, um, but it's, it's kind of an amazing model really. Uh, I'm not gonna talk too much about that, but I know Mariah at Aljoya Thornton Place would be happy to kind of drill in and explain in detail what they do there. Wonderful. Uh, any other questions that you guys have? Okay, Patty North has a question. Let me see if I can actually. I'm gonna stop my share and then I'll be able to. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, go there ahead. Are, yes. All right. Um, I'm aware of situations where someone has lived in uh, a retirement, not a retirement community, a, um, well, let, let's say a life plan community. And, and they become, um, they need more support or help than would typically be given in that, in that portion of the community. For example, somebody's living there and they become incontinent. Mm -hmm. Now that's not skilled nursing to clean somebody up, no. but it's but it's labor intensive um, to kind of to to do that all day twenty or twenty four hours a day. Mm -hmm. So th these people are being asked to leave the community where they're living be because of of just labor issues, not because of skill issues. So so, so say talk about how. How can you predict, yeah. how do you choose a place that's not going to boot you out? <laughs> so one of the things that I would suggest doing is as you are looking at communities, when you're talking with the community relations director, you know, talk about the services that they provide, you know, and ask some specific questions. Sometimes you're, they're, they're, they may ask you some very personal questions and, and it can be very uncomfortable to talk about some of those personal services. But it's important to talk about those personal services, even if you are not yet experiencing some of those services. If, you, if you're choosing a community because it's an assisted living community and you don't want to have to move again, you really wanna drill into specifically what services do they provide and under what circumstances might you have to move? You really wanna ask them, under what circumstances might I have to move out of this community? What services do you not provide? You know, Now that doesn't necessarily mean, again, that you're going to need every single service. You know, um, I was mentioning that you know, communities that provide two-person transfer assistance. Not a lot of us are going to actually need two-person transfer assistance, but we might, you know. Um, if you have a debilitative condition that indicates that you probably will, that's a very good question to ask. You know, if, if you are experiencing continent issues right now and are managing your own continence, and it's not, you know, that's one thing. If you have a level of cognitive decline and you have continence issues, Will they support your continence issues until you move to memory care? Most memory care units, well, all that I know of, will absolutely support continence care. But assisted living communities will support continence care to different degrees. 
So you really, really want to drill in and ask specifically those questions before you move in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. That's a good question. Thank you. See, I can. Anybody else have questions? You can type them in the chat. You can raise your hand. Ah, Bert. Bert, can you unmute yourself? Bert, you are muted. We there we are. Um, oh. so I have two things. One, just a statement, just because it was, it has to do with an adult family home. And my mother was in one where the owner, she actually had three adult family homes. And she was a registered nurse. Mm -hmm. I'm only mentioning that because she wound up needing to have a shot and, it, and the, the, the owner nurse was able to give it, which, which prevented her from having to go into a nursing home. Mm -hmm. So, but the, and the question I had, Tina, you mentioned elder care advisor. Yes. Yes. Where are those people? <laughs> well, you Who know, I, I <laughs> so elder care advisors um, are people who specifically will consult with you and talk through what your needs are, what you want, what you can afford, etc., and then help you narrow down your options to the best three or four options that most likely are going to be the best fit for you. They tend to focus on specific geographic areas. Before I came to El Era Living, in fact, I was an elder care advisor for a few years. And, and I, I really love that sitting down and consulting with families and talking through what they need. Um, I have a list of different elder care advisors that operate in different areas around the greater Seattle area, which I can send to the Ida Culver team and they can make sure to get to you. That would be the, great. Way that, the way they work is you as the consumer are not the one that pays their fee. Their fee is paid once you successfully move into a community of your choice that is the best fit, they are then paid a commission. It's the same no matter where they put you. So they're not incented to put you in the highest you know, cost place because if they put you in the wrong place and it doesn't work, they don't get paid. Plus their reputation is really based on their successful placements of people. So they, they are really an invaluable partner when you're looking at adult family homes in particular, because those are so much harder to, to gauge on your own than an assisted living community or a memory care community. Oftentimes you can do the legwork with an independent living community, assisted living community on your own. And you can really get a good feel for that. You can ask a lot of resident questions and, and really understand what you're getting. It's a lot harder to do with an adult family home. Yes, yes. But I mean, do they have, are, are they part of other entities? So they, they, um, they, they, they can be small independent business owners or they can work for larger agencies, organizations. Um, they are regulated by the state of Washington. There is, there is a, a law called the Elder and Vulnerable Adult Protection Agency Act okay. that specifies how they can operate and some of the, the, the laws that they must adhere to in order to protect the consumer. Um, there is an organization that's called the Association of Referral Professionals of Washington State. Um, and there are a number of members. You can find one there too. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to get Bert. <laughs> that's funny. Okay, so Bert, you have to unmute yourself. We might be able to unmute. Let me see. So we, Bert, it says it's going to say on your. Oh, he's unmuted now. There oh. we go. No, he's not. We're going to get it. There we go, Bert. You got it. Got it. Okay. There uh, we are. You know, how, how do you evaluate skilled nursing facilities? Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and, the, and the corollary to that is 
Why did uh, Ida Culver Broadview stop their rehab? So I can answer the first question and sort of the second question. With When you're looking at skilled nursing facilities, there's a different website you want to look at. It is the medicare.gov site. And you can go there and you'll, there's actually, there's several ways you can evaluate. The best way to evaluate a community, regardless of the type is go visit, you know, how does it look? How does it smell? How do the residents seem? Talk with the nursing staff, you know, kick the tires. But the other thing you can do is you can go onto the medicare.gov site and look at their ratings and see, are they offering more therapy than others? You know, have they had more deficiencies? There's, there are a lot of, of different places you can look at because they are very highly regulated and there's a lot of information out there. And I, know, I can tell you that with, with Ida Culver Broadview, one of the reasons that we moved away from skilled nursing is because what we were finding was truly the highest level of demand in that area was for secured memory care rather than skilled nursing. There wasn't a lack of skilled nursing in that area, but there was a shortage of secured memory care. And so it was really mostly a matter of moving to where the demand was. And also I can speak to that a little bit, uh, Bert. We, we found that the demand for our current residents was not necessarily for skilled nursing. It was for a higher level of assisted living care. So we had a big gap between assisted living and then skilled nursing, and we were losing people in that, in that gap. So now we have increased our capabilities to be able to care for those people through that higher level of assisted living care. And we find that most people were using skilled nursing or rehab as short term. So we can refer them to uh, you know, Columbia Lutheran or another skilled nursing in our area where they get their rehab services and then they come back home to us. Um, so our goal here is to keep our folks as independent uh, as possible for as long as possible. And so we're really able to have our residents be here for a lo much longer period of time and it's worked really, really well. And as I, as I mentioned, remember, realistically, only about 4% of us are ever going to need to live long-term in a nursing home. So though you may need a rehab, you'll then come back to your community or your home or wherever it is you call home. Uh, let's see, Tina, we've got another question. Where on the DSHS website can I find the survey? So um, Julie or Pam or Cheryl can, can in their follow-up, send you the link to the, to the correct page. I sent that to them. And what you'll do is you will, you will put, you will, you can query by zip code or you can query by specific community. So you would, you would type in the zip code and hit the query button. And then it would pull up those communities and it would say, this community has reports. Every community has reports. It doesn't necessarily mean they're negative reports. It could be their fire inspection report. It could be a report that said this community has no deficiencies. But go ahead and look at the ones that you're interested in. You know, if you pull up a community and you can see, oh my gosh, they've had 10 violations in the last two years, you know, or enforcement letters or stop placement, that's probably not a place you want to go to because that indicates that there are systemic problems that they haven't corrected. You know, if you go in and you find that, oh, this community had a, one violation which they fixed a couple of years ago, or this community has had, you know, and it also depends on the severity. So I do encourage you to read those reports for any of those communities that you are interested in looking at, but then also look at their actual surveys when you are touring. They are supposed to be out publicly available to you so you can just read through them. And then if you have any questions on that survey, you can ask the staff to talk with you a little bit about that survey. Awesome. Do any of these facilities uh, transition to hospice care at all, or is that something else? Actually, most communities will allow hospice care to come in. So there, there are very few hospice locations where you actually go to for hospice. There's Evergreen Hospice over in Kirkland, um, but it's a very small number of beds and there are some very specific requirements in order to go to actually a location specifically for hospice. Hospice can come to you, whether you're living in an assisted living community, a memory care community, adult family home, hospice comes to you. And very few communities will say, no, we don't want hospice. I mean, it's a good question. If, if, I would want to know that when I need hospice, are hospice services allowed to come in? 95% of the time people are going to say, yes, absolutely, we, we, we invite hospice in. 
And here at Ida Culver House Broadview, that's that's the case here. We have several residents who will decide on uh, which hospice team they want to have here. Um, usually that decision is made in conjunction with our community health director, Louise Reed, and she will give her input. Um, and then the hospice services come into the residence apartment here. Those are good questions. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyone else? Oh, Vicki. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so uh, what's the average age of uh, a person mm -hmm. deciding upon um, a, a particular community? And well, I know there are different degrees too. And the second question is uh, pets. Mm -hmm. Questions if pets are allowed. So I'll take the first question. The age is gonna vary depending on the type of community, you will find that the age demographic skews younger in a community that is primarily a, uh, an independent living community and it'll skewer, excuse me, skew a little bit lower in a CCRC environment. And that's typically because a, a bigger portion of your residents are independent. And as we age, we tend to then need more services. In a community that is a standalone assisted living community, it tends to be a little older. It's usually about two to three years older and you're, you're oldest residents tend to live, if they're, if, if they're making a first move anyway, tend to be in your adult family homes. Um, for example, my mother is, uh, she's only, um, she's not quite 78 and she is moving into an independent living community uh, come this fall. We're working on finalizing the one from her choices. She's not local, she's over in Spokane. But uh, so, you know, with an independent, I would say people move in usually between about 78 to 84. Within an assisted living community, it tends to, to start closer to 80 to 86, you know, um, although the age range can vary drastically, partly because as humans, our functionality can, can vary drastically. You know, I know 70 year olds who have the functionality of, of someone who's 90. And I know 90 year olds who have the functionality of someone who's 70. So well, a lot of it comes down to your functional age, not your actual chronological age. So that's something to really keep in mind. And then with pets, um, I know era living communities do accept pets. Many communities do accept pets. There's typically a pet fee, but um, a lot of communities will accept your pet because they know that, you know, we love our pets. They're, they're kind of like our children. We don't want to leave them. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I will say um, the average uh, kind of what, what we see in terms of uh, age group for the residents here at Ida Culver House Broadview is a, a big, big range, just like Tina said. Um, I would say, I think right now our youngest resident is 68, 69 years old. And I think our oldest resident is coming up on 104. And so it's, it's we've got everything, which I well, think and, is awesome. And the interesting thing is, you, you won't necessarily know that by looking at people either. You know, you, you really, you really won't know. All right, let's see. Thank Just you. A few minutes. I think Bert has another question. I'm gonna, it's gonna ask you on your screen, Bert, to unmute. Am I unmuted again? Yeah, there you're you good. Go. Oh, can you hear me? We can. Okay. I was wondering the gender ratios. Uh, how many single men, single women, married couples mm -hmm. usually? You know, generally, what, what, what's the ratios? Uh, you know, or I, do you, go ahead, Tina. No, you go ahead first, Julie. Are you, are you curious about Ida Culver House Broadview in particular? Um, yes, yeah. yeah, Broadview. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would say we're looking at about a 70-30. So about 70% ladies. Um, just by the nature of life, uh, we have uh, many single women that live here. They seem to uh, live a, a bit longer than men. Um, so, uh, and I would say, you know, out of about 270 some residents that we have here, I'd say we have about 40 married couples that live here. Um, so definitely we have more widowed ladies, but we do have a great group of, of single gentlemen that live here. Um, our married couples are very, um, you know, they're able to interact with 
all different types of people that live there. So, yeah. What do you think, Tina? What is our... our so, uh, usually within the industry, Julie's about right on. The It's usually two-thirds women to about a third men in, in a retirement community environment. Um, it's much higher in, in, uh, in an adult family home. Adult family homes have a lot more women than men. You, you might have a, a community of six, four of them are women, four or five of them are women, you have one man. And part of that is, yes, gentlemen, we're still outliving you as ladies. But the other part that, that is interesting is oftentimes it's because women tend to be a little bit more willing to move into a community when they have needs. Um, and sometimes men are not quite as willing to make that move, you know, in focus groups, when we've been talking with, with, uh, couples about what is your greatest barrier to moving into a community? Sometimes the women will say my husband. So yeah, the lady, <laughs> ladies, ladies, sometimes we're ready to give up cooking and cleaning and that sort of thing, you know? Wonderful. <laughs> well, that brings us to about time here. Um, I want to thank you very much, Tina. This is very uh, interesting information. I learn stuff from you all the time, um, which I really appreciate. Um, and then, of course, thank you all to you folks for joining us this afternoon. If you have uh, further questions or you want to get any further information on this, please feel free to uh, email. You can email Daniel, who you all got an email from, Daniel Calvillo. Um, and we'll be able to get you uh, all the information that you need. Um, yeah, I would say that's about it. Thank you so much again, Tina. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Thanks everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon. All right, bye.